This story of colonization was a universal story before it was a local story. Every tribal nation confronted the same challenges to their sovereignty, from the Haudenosaunee on the East Coast to the tribes and nations in Washington State. To be Native American and alive today is to have survived attempted genocide. Oren Lyons, faith keeper of the Onondaga Nation, speaks to the strength of his people and the government of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. He attests to the endurance and power of his people's sovereignty and does so without ever mentioning the word. Sovereignty is the state of existence as a self-governing entity. Like the individual states of the United States, each member of the Haudenosaunee retains the authority to govern its own internal affairs. Within the framework of the Great Law and its own specific laws, each individual nation reserves the right to adjudicate internal disputes, pass laws for the welfare of their own community, assess fees, regulate trade and commerce, control immigration and citizenship, oversee public works, approve land use, and appoint officials to act on its behalf. Every member of the Haudenosaunee has the authority to defend its citizens against internal and external dangers and to advocate for the peaceful resolution of conflict and the equitable distribution of collective resources. Today's times, I've watched this change over a period of time. Like my elder brother here, we've seen a lot of changes. You know, I grew up early on at Onondaga when there was just one car there. The rest was all horse and wagon. I grew up in that horse and wagon. I could harness a horse. I could. Uh, I could set up a wagon. I knew how to do that because you had to. That's what it was. And we raised all our own food. Everything, we grew everything, basically. I grew up in a kind of, this is in New York, central New York. Yeah. And I think I was four years old the first time I saw a white man. There was four of us. We were playing along the road in the bushes, and here comes a, a rag man. He's, he's got a wagon and a horse, and he's a white man selling rags. And, ooh, you scary to us. We were hiding in the bushes, and we watched him go by, you know. <laughs> but he was an old man, and he had a white beard, and he had a black hat and a black coat. And we watched him. <laughs> he didn't see us. Mm -hmm. We got to go by. <laughs> and it, we learned that our mothers would bargain with him for whatever it was, you know. So after a while, we got to know who, who he was. But that was the first time, because we were growing up in Onondaga. We never, never went anywhere but we running around in the woods there. And we never. We never played or on the road. We were always in the woods. That's where we were. We were swimming. We were out all day. We could feed ourselves out there. We knew what we could eat. We didn't have to go for lunch or nothing. We feed ourselves. The age groups run together, you know. We out there fishing, 
swimming, running, playing. It was really nice. I didn't realize how how lucky we were to be able to have that kind of a life. I didn't know that. Now, we didn't have much, you know. People were hungry a lot, all the time. But you could go next door and you could get a carrot or a cup of potatoes or something. Kids run next door. You got a potato? Yeah. You know they're going to make some kind of food somewhere. So, you know. so everybody shared everything. And so it had a community. You could go in and out of anybody's house and they'll take care of you. You know, what's your mother's name? How is she doing? You know, they knew everybody. So we had this big kind of family run. It's nice. It's not like that now. Things have changed. So when I was asked to take a council position, I was already working in New York City as a commercial artist. I had established a business. I knew advertising. And uh, I was asked to come back and take leadership help. That's pretty hard. Actually, it, it was probably why I, our marriage didn't last to that decision to go home. And uh, I did. So like I say, I've been learning. The first thing I had to do was pay attention before that security there at Underdog was always there. The chiefs were there, the clan mothers, everybody was. So you didn't worry about it because it was just there. But then when you began to take on that responsibility, then you go, whoa, this is a lot of work. It's a total commitment. And the traditional system was you don't receive any pay. There was no such thing 1,500 years ago. You had a duty and you had work, and that was what you did. And since we've kept that system, that's the way it is yet today. There's no payroll for our leaders. They take care of us. They do as best we can because the things are different, but fundamentally, the rules, the laws are the same. And I think, from what I understand, that Six Nations is the last standing traditional government still in charge of land in North America now. Every other government, whether you're in Canada or the United States, has an elective system. Not where I come from. And we have the first treaty with the blossoming United States, 1775. When the Continental Congress requested a meeting with us in the new headquarters called Albany, New York, that's where Mohawk Fire was at one time, that camp there. And of course, we know their father. So they were going to get ready for a big fight. But we saw the fight. We've been working with them for 400 years. And uh, they asked us to join. And I'm going to make a point here, but it takes a little long, so I have to bear with me. And so at this time, they're getting ready to fight. And the Continental Congress, 62 members of the Continental Congress, asked the Six Nation Confederacy to come and sit with them. And we did. It's a long story to that. I won't go through that. But we had a meeting. And at that meeting, they told us about the problems they were facing. And we knew about that because we knew the leaders. We were in constant 
discussion with them, whether it was in Maryland or whether it was in Maine, whether it was in Georgia, our leaders were there. So we knew, we knew what was happening, but we were well aware. And there was a split in the, the Christian doctrine, the Catholics, and then you had the, the uh, Church of England, which was not Catholic. They had split. And that split carried over into the colonies. So we were aware of that as well. And it was coming to a head, and it was, 1775, so they asked us to join them. And our leader said, we know your father. We've been dealing with your father for a long time. We know you. And we think, we think that this coming fight, which we know is coming because our minds are split like yours. We have people thinking this way and that way. We're making preparations. So it's well known that probably one of the worst thing you can do is step in between a family fight. <laughs> Everybody knows you don't get your nose in there, otherwise they both turn on you. We say this is a family fight between you and your father. We don't think it's a good idea. And we had this discussion with your father just three months ago in Oswego. Same thing. And they said, good, because that was our second request. If you're not going to fight with us, don't fight against us. And we said, we will take that position, as we said to your father. We stand back in a neutral position. You settled this between yourselves, but you're in our land. There's no way. That. So at some point, you're going to see our men in the field on both sides. But when you see them there, remember that they're there as an individual. They're not representing their nation, nor are they representing the Confederacy. We're free people, and we can't tell people what to do. But you will see, and that's the way it was. <laughs> I move up to 1983. Uh, you had a president at that time. He was a Hollywood actor. Remember him? And he was uh, re-energizing the draft. You remember the draft? And so, and that's what he did, you know. So all of a sudden, our young men were getting letters in the mail saying, you know, report to your draft. I said, we're going to do this. We said, well, bring them to us. Don't ignore it. Bring me here. We'll fill it out, and we'll send it down to them and say, you can't draft our men. And so this went on for a while. And then we got a call from the United States Selective Service System saying, can we have a meeting with you guys? And we said, yes, of course. Uh, what's the subject? This is, your men are refusing our, our draft. <laughs> we said, oh, good. We'll have that discussion, please come up. So we set the time. We met with them Mother's Day, 1983. And they said, you set the time on Mother's Day. We said, every day is Mother's Day. <laughs> every day. So we had the meeting. And they said, we know what your position here is not new. We know that, but we don't know where, where's, where is it? Where does it start? And we were ready. We had our men lined up. We had the wampum belts laid out. And we went back, 1744. 
And we told them we were talking about that discussion in 1744 when Six Nations was presiding, presiding over a, a meeting in Lancaster, Pennsylvania about land as usual, you know, the colonies and Six Nations was pre presiding because all the land was Indian land. And um, we were trying to protect the interests of our people, the nations, the land. So they were squabbling between themselves, the colonists. And one of the Onondaga chiefs stood up and he said to them, you know, you people never gonna to amount to anything until you learn how to work together. Why don't you make a union like ours? The principle of peace. That's the principle of our peace. Equity, to be fair to everybody and to be united. We're the first United Nations, Iroquois, way back, based on the woman side. The women are in charge of the clans. We have five leaders, clan mother, principal chief, deputy, faith keeper man, faith keeper female. That's our, in every clan, they have duties. Her duty is to find those leaders, choose those leaders. So it's the clan mother that chooses the leader. But it has to be ratified by consensus by the clan and then ratified by consensus by the council chiefs and then finally ratified by consensus by the Six Nation Confederacy. So you just don't walk in there. And if you get chosen to be sitting there, you better think about your history because they're gonna know everything you ever did. <laughs> and I, I didn't realize that. <laughs> but then I was like, oh, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but the nations cut you a lot of slack anyway. 1744, the Sundaga chief said to them, you know, you're just not going to, you got to work together. And in 1775, then, when we met the speaker for the Continental Congress, said to us at that time, in 1744 in Lancaster, you advised us to make a union like yours. We are now taking your advice. That's where your United States started from. You don't know that. Mm -hmm. You haven't been told that. It's not in your history books. But it's in the history. It's in the congressional records of the United States. It's not a figment. It's written down word for word what they said. We're going to make a union like yours based on peace, equity, union. And so I said I was going to make a point and I come all the way around to that. <laughs> but you have to know the history in order to understand the point. And so you'll find that most Indian nations and speakers have this way of doing things. They have to take you from the beginning so that you can understand. You can't just tell somebody. You have to show the process. And it was a great experiment. Now I would say, you know, you know what the first flag was for the Continental Congress? Anybody here know the first flag? It's a pine tree. It's a pine tree. And what is 
What is the symbol for the Haudenosaunee? It's a great white pine. Peace. And when they called us in 1775, they said, we want to rekindle our relationship under your great tree of peace. You don't know that. I'm telling you, that's your history. And we have treaties. After the Revolutionary War, and I won't go through that one, very hard fight. The first treaty that the new United States made was made in France, 18, 1783, and that was the peace between England and the colonies, now, now the United States. The second treaty that the new United States made was with the Haudenosaunee. 1784, because they had to. We were a force. We were a power. 1784. And we said, they said a lot of bad things happen, but let's forget that and now we'll have a, a union. So we began that treaty. Another one, 1787, another one, 1789, 1790, 1794, treaties between nations. And they stand every year delivered to our nations, the Six Nations, from the United States treaty cloth. Every year. They know, they hold that treaty. And in uh, 2016, they invited us to the White House and to the renew the 1794 Treaty, Peace and Friendship. So treaties are real. You have a very powerful treaty here. And all the work that this man has done that's enormous work. That's your history. And where he started, seven, you know, 1823, going back, there's more history. Oh, <laughs> But anyway, there it is. And that brings us up to the contemporary times. So the discussion about peace and friendship, going back to those treaties that we have. Foundational to what we face in the future. Because this discussion of what we're looking out there now and what we're having the discussion is nature. Nature. We have affected the process of life in the world. We've affected it. And we don't have a wrench big enough to fix that. Ice is melting. Ice is melting fast faster and faster. And so I would say that we have to put aside, and I'm talking now about the human family, can't be Indians or black people or yellow people or white people, it's our family, the human beings, we're a family. We come in all colors, we come in all sizes, but we're still one family. And if we're going to survive as a species, that's the way you have to think. All aside, all of us aside, we now have to work together for all oh, that little that little guy that was dancing so hard. That's our responsibility. Look after him. 
and that's, you know, the meeting that a friend over there put together. And that's the discussion that's been going on for a long time. This has been going on, but now, it's, as they say, it's time to fish or cut bait. That's it. You know, no second chances on this one. No second chances. We're in it now. We're in it. We're in climate change. It's going to go on, and it's going to get worse. And the only way we're going to survive as a species is to work together. Common cause. And remember the two laws, respect and share. If we follow those two laws, we've got a chance. We have a chance. But it's got to be that way. 1950, I was 20 years old. And there were three or 2.5 billion people in the world, all told, the whole world, 2.5 billion people. And here we are like 68 years later, 7.6 billion people in the world within this last 68 years. Almost triple the population, soon to be eight. Where's the water? Where's the food? Where's the land? Where's our relationship? We have responsibility to those people in Africa. We have responsibility to all those people. If you help them where they are, then they're not going to be moving. But water is the issue. And water is not adjudicated evenly around the world. So if you don't have water, you're going to go look for it. You know, we're pretty strong. We can go 70, 80 days without eating. We can starve a long time. <laughs> Try to go 10 days without water. Try to go four days. You're going to go. You're going to go look for water. That's what you're looking at right now today. You mentioned the River Jordan. The River Jordan is down to one third of what it was before. It's mud today, right now. There's no water there. You have to have a bigger vision. You have to think global, because this is a global problem. A global problem requires a global solution. You can't fix one side and not the other, because no, that's not the way nature works. We get all of us. So it's for our common good as a human species to try to survive this crisis that we we brought on. You can't go and you can't blame the trees. You can't blame the salmon. They didn't do that. It's us. You know there's a uh, you guys know about Pogo? And Pogo, pretty smart. He said one thing, and I always remember what he said. I was reading it. He says, I have seen the enemy, and it is us. Pogo. True words can be said. So, my message then here is. So thankful to see your dancers and your songs. Oh, it's a credit, that's a credit to your nation. Because that's where it is. That's the spiritual strength that you need there. That's where we have to go. This is a spiritual crisis. And it can only be a spiritual solution. So that's up to all of us here. 
Now, Tom and I have been in this a long time. But we're not through. We're not through. The last time I spoke to the UN, I went like this. I said, don't let this fool you. <laughs> no. Fight is on. Hard one. But we can do it. We can do it for this guy here. You can do it. You just got to share. And you just got to have respect. Those two can save the world. Donate to them.